Welcome to the second video in the series. We're building a PyDP11. This is a scaled replica of the Digital Equipment Corporation's seminal mini computer, the PDP11. In part one, we prepared the Raspberry Pi, which drives the replica. This is the second of our four videos. This time, we're going to work on assembling the dozens of fiddly passive components. Let's get building. You're going to need the following. Large Phillips screwdriver, small Phillips screwdriver, masking tape, electrical tape, emery cloth or maybe Scotch-Brite, scissors, solder, soldering iron, side cutters, two breadboard jumpers or some similar test leads, pliers, and a well-ventilated work area. I'm going to start by sorting all the components out by type. You'll receive them jumbled together in a single bag. Tease out a pile of diodes, two types of resistors, screws, nuts and bolts, rotary switches, a GPIO connector, a lock, a set of keys, a chip socket and a chip, plus a few zip ties. Now take a look at the board. We're going to solder things in vertical order. That is to say, the stuff closest to the actual board gets done first. Quick note, before we get going, Soldering involves molten metal, hot irons, and noxious vapors. A kit like this assumes that you have some basic skill assembling electronics. If in doubt, I've included some links to safety best practices in the description. Do not try any of this at home unless you understand the risks and you've had a bit of practice. Second quick note, Oscar encourages you to use quite a low soldering temperature. In the first part of this video, I'm trying to follow his advice to the letter. I've set my iron to 275 degrees. More on this later. So now, nanny mode off. The first and smallest pieces are these little diodes. Diodes are directional. You'll need to be absolutely sure you match up the band on the component with the band on the board. Each switch will need a diode. Each rotary encoder gets several. There's also one for the chip socket. I tend to bend component legs first to get a tidy fit, but I'm not obsessive enough to be precise. I'm putting all the components in place in one go. Then I'm applying masking tape to hold them in place. You can go piece by piece, but this should be a bit more efficient. Once the tape's on, we'll flip the board over and start soldering. When we've been around all of our diodes, we can move on to the resistors. Now there are two types. You'll use six of these 1K jobs and then a block of 12 390 ohm resistors. I always forget the color code, so I've put up a guide for you. As before, I'm doing them all in one go, taping them up and batching through the soldering. The GPIO connector comes next. It's probably just the economy gear I use and likely my own lack of skill, but I started wanting a little more heat at this point. I ended up going over a lot of my joints twice to make sure I was happy they were sound. With a connector like this one, you want it to be tacked on straight first before cranking through each of the connections. So, first do the corners. Now, I'm not thrilled with my own efforts here. I appear to have twisted it a degree or two out. However, aesthetics aside, this didn't cause an issue. What I should be doing next is the chip socket. So I'm working slightly out of sequence. It's a minor mistake, which doesn't really affect the outcome. Instead, we'll do the LEDs first. Each of these needs to be mounted with a standoff spacer. That's what all these little plastic sleeves are. I'm taking a minute to go through all the LEDs and slip on the spacers. There's an open end and a closed end. We insert the LED into the open end. Basically, the long pin goes first, and then a little gentle twisting uh, will get the shorter pin to pop through. LEDs are directional too, of course, and so look closely at the silk screen. There should be an indicator above the par high label. Long leg should always go to the left. Working steadily through, the LEDs should go almost snap into the board when pushed into place. Oscar includes this PCB guide to go over all of the LEDs. It guarantees that they're aligned vertically and they're all pushed home. No need for the tape this time. So with the guide in place, flip the assembly over, look carefully at each pair of legs down the board. They should all be the same. Long leg to the right, since we're now upside down. Be thorough, or you could blow one of them out by mistake. Okay, get the iron out and do one leg the whole way around, then the other leg. 
This is just a safety thing to avoid anything overheating. Now looking at my work, I'm still a little worried about having to go over things a second time. I'm not usually that hopeless with an iron. With that out of the way, flip it all back over. Since I didn't put the chip socket on first, I now need to take the LED cover off again. And then there's this guide notch on the part. You want that to match up with the silk screen outline as you place it. The notch should be on the upside. Time for a little more masking tape. Like the header, you want to start by tacking this in place. So make sure everything's square. And then we want to run through the rest of the contacts pretty quickly. Next, we need to put the rotary switches in place. Chances are you'll need to straighten the pins on these a little bit to get them to drop in. Make sure that you get them to go all the way home to the pin shoulders and then tape them down. Over on the other side, tack two pins in as usual before going the whole way around. Again, you're trying to make sure that they're square before you finalize your soldering. Flip it back, pull the tape off and make sure everything's still square. Okay, with the board face up, we want to mount the chip. The chip should have a little dot or notch too. It needs to go the right way up. So now look closely at the chip. How far are those pins splayed? If they're not really close on 90 degrees, you may want to gently push them over. Try to set the pins into the socket as closely as possible before starting to apply a little gentle pressure. Make sure that they're all getting started before stuffing it the whole way home. Change of pace. The board is complete enough to act as an output device. You don't need to do all the switches for that, so it's a good time to test out all the basic LED functionality. I'll take this back over to my workstation and hook the Pi up. Before we do that, we need some electrical insulation on the tall metal components of the Pi. The USB and LAN sockets are metal faces and can potentially ground onto the board, so take a bit of electrical tape and cover them up. Push the Pi face down on the GPIO header. Check to make sure that you haven't shifted a pin or two off from the header. You have to be able to get into the Pi's OS, so make sure you plug in a keyboard and monitor so you can see what you're doing. Plug in the power. Let's see what we get. Ideally, after a few seconds, all the lamps should come on at once. Check for any duds. If you find problems, log into the Pi, shut everything down, start investigating. The Obsolescence Guaranteed Forums are a good place to start for help. The same advice will hold true for any of these other tests if they fail. However, if test one was a success, let's move on to test two. All the lamps are on because the board thinks that you're holding the lamp test switch down. Well, let's let the switch up, and we're going to do that by looking for the switch footprint on the board. And then we're going to take a test lead and put it across the top two holes in that footprint. What should happen is you should see most of the lights go off with some still on, but not all of them. This is what the panel should look like during default simulation. The simulation should be just flashing some lights. Over on the keyboard and monitor, we want to see what's happening at the Pi's console. Because our next test is to tell the emulator to stop, and so you'll be able to see that from the console. Get your second test lead out, leave the first one in place, and momentarily short the top two contacts of the halt switch footprint. That should cause the emulation to stop and display a command prompt. If you get that, we can start everything back up by shorting the top two contacts of the continue footprint. Okay, last set of tests. We're gonna try out the rotary knobs. Try turning each of them. They should just have a hint of notchiness. For each tick, you should see the lit LED lamp next to the switch move to an adjacent lamp. Both of them should do this in a cycle. Everything working? Okay then, we'll run a shutdown command. Unplug everything, and in our next video, we'll work on the case and switches. But that's it for part two of this series. Part three should follow shortly. See you in part three.